What's going on everybody? My name is Caleb and this video is going to be all about smart pointers in C++. It can be an intimidating topic, but by the end of this video, you're going to have a very thorough understanding of the different types of smart pointers and when you should use them. These are different than regular pointers in C++, which I have videos on, so feel free to check those out if you want the background. But we'll also do a quick intro in this video as well, so don't feel like you have to do a ton of studying. You should get what you need in this video alone. Before we start, if you want more content like this, but in a lot more depth, I have an upcoming C and C++ master course. So if you want to be notified of when that's released, I'll drop a link down below for you to get on my newsletter. That's where I share all upcoming content, new releases, courses, all the good stuff. So definitely get on that list. So to get started, let's take a look at what a normal pointer looks like. So to create a pointer, we'll first start with some data. We'll create an integer a and assign it to value five. Now we'll create a pointer to type int. We'll call it b and assign it the address of a. Now b points to the address of a. This means they both can access the value five. So to see this, we could output a and when we do this, obviously we should get the value five in the output, but we could also access that value through B, and this is called dereferencing. So if we get the value that B points to, we are dereferencing that and we should see the value five. Additionally, you can change the data this way as well. So both of these have right access to the data. We can say B is now 10. Running this, we get 10 and a is going to be changed as well. So we will see the output 10. So this is basic pointers 101. You should understand all of this code. It's a basically the prerequisite for what we're going to be talking about. Smart pointers, although different, work in very similar ways when it comes to how you create them and dereference them and all of that. So ideally you have this down. So we're going to set up a scenario where you want to use a smart pointer. You don't necessarily need to use a smart pointer in all scenarios, and I'll try to help you understand when you should consider using one. In this scenario, it's very simple and there's no real value of a smart pointer. The value is usually introduced when we start working with other functions. So let's go ahead and clear out our code here, and we're going to create a new function up here. And what this function is going to do is return an integer pointer, and we'll just give it some name such as getData. And what we're going to do is we're going to return some pointer that we create inside of the function. And this is going to be a problem that you're quickly going to see. So we create some data A and then return the address of, which in other words, a pointer to that data. Inside of main, we'll create some pointer. We'll just call it B just so we don't mix these up. Although you could call them the same thing. And what's going to happen now is we have undefined behavior. When we print B, we're not guaranteed to get a successful result. And the reason that is, is because the data that we're sending a pointer back from is defined locally inside of get data. After this function ends, that data is no longer in scope. So the pointer is no longer valid. And when we print it, we get undefined behavior. So most likely we'll run this, we'll get the value five. But if you do something such as print the value a few times, now it's going to get a little weird and you can see we have 511. This didn't cause any compiling errors, but thankfully we got a warning and it says address of stack memory associated with local variable A returned. And what this is saying is, hey, you created something on the stack and you're returning a pointer to that data. Well, that stack is no longer valid outside of the function, so we can't trust it down here. The general solution to this is instead of using the stack, we use the heap. The heap is another area of memory that we can manage ourselves using new or smart pointers. So as you start learning more about C++ and you want to basically have the lifetime of this survive beyond the scope of this function, what you would do is have a pointer directly here. So int a is a new int with the value five. Now, you don't need to return the address of A, you can just return A directly. Now inside of main, we get the expected output, but general best practice is whenever you use new, you will want to remove that memory when you're done, and you do that by saying delete, and then the pointer to that memory. So you can just say delete B. So this is the next step, and in general, this is better than what we had because now we have predictable behavior, we just have to manually manage that memory ourselves. While this isn't necessarily a problem, and it is a lot better than C programming where you have to worry about the appropriate size, 
there are some better options. So while you still may use new in certain scenarios, you can instead use a smart pointer. And that's going to abstract away the memory management for us even farther so that we don't have to worry about new and delete at all. And that is the value that a smart pointer brings to the table. So before you start using them, if you understand when you should use them, it makes a little bit more sense. It's basically a pointer that deals with the memory management for you. So let's go ahead and convert this code to our first smart pointer, and then we're going to talk about the different types of smart pointers because there are a few. So to get started, we're going to include memory. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change the type of this variable. It's no longer going to be an int pointer. Instead, it's going to be a shared underscore PTR pointer, and we'll use the angle brackets because this will take a type of int, and this is going to come from the standard namespace. So this is what it's going to look like on the left. This is how we create a shared pointer, which is one of the smart pointer types. We'll talk about some of the others here soon. However, the right hand side needs updated as well. We're no longer going to say new int. Instead, we're going to say standard make shared. And this is going to take an int for the type. So the syntax, I agree, is a little bit more complicated but overall it's not terribly bad. But we are going to need to change the return type as well because right now it's saying int pointer, but really we're going to return a shared pointer of type int. So let's go ahead and replace that here. That should fix our problem, and when we save, it gets rid of the error. Now we just have to take a look at the calling code, how we're going to change that. Very similarly, we're going to have the same type over here on the left. So we'll replace int pointer with standard shared pointer of type int and we no longer need to invoke delete. So this is our updated code. When we run this, we get 555, just like we would expect. But behind the scenes, the shared pointer keeps track of references to this memory, and will keep it alive as long as it's being used. This makes it so much easier, we don't have to worry about calling delete at the right time, which can save us from potential memory leaks. So a good indicator of when you might want to use a smart pointer is when you're using the new keyword. If you see new, just think this might be able to be replaced with a smart pointer. Now let's talk about the different types of smart pointers. There's three main types. The first one, which we already learned, is a shared pointer. This is the easiest, most simple to work with, and there's no weird gotchas you have to concern yourself with. This is the closest thing to a regular pointer, just with the added benefit of not having to invoke delete or new. Now, the word shared implies that multiple things could point to this data, and they're all going to share ownership of that memory. So the memory won't be deleted until all of those pointers go out of scope and are no longer referring to that area of memory. So what that means is we could create another pointer and pro tip, you can use the auto keyword if you don't feel like typing everything out and we'll say C, assigning it B. Same thing here, you can do that. So you can say auto and you can say auto here as well. It's up to you if you wish to do that. I like to do that when we have really long types just because it keeps our code a little cleaner. What we have now is a new pointer called C that also refers to this data. So we can print B and C, and let's go ahead and just have those two lines there. So running this, we get the value twice. This is perfectly legal with a shared pointer. These both refer to that area of memory, and that memory will be preserved until both of these variables are no longer in scope. This is the key difference between a shared pointer and what we're going to talk about now, which is a unique pointer. A unique pointer can only have one owner. To show this, what I want to do is I want to alter our code from a shared pointer to a unique pointer. So instead of make shared, it's going to be make unique. And the type returned is not going to be a shared pointer, it's going to be a unique pointer. This code is all good. The problem we now see is coming from line 11 because we're trying to create a new pointer when B is labeled unique. So we're not going to be able to do that, and we're limited to just using B, but we can use it as you would expect. You can get the output like so. Before we move on to the third type of pointer, I want to talk about some useful methods when it comes to unique pointers. In the scenario here of the unique pointer being returned, it moves from being assigned to A to now B, and that's okay because A is no longer in scope. So that's not a problem. But when we had the code 
auto C being assigned B, well, this new pointer C is not going to work, but what if we wanted to say, hey, transfer the ownership from B to C? There's a method to do that, and it's standard move passing in the old pointer. Now C is the owner, and dereferencing B is undefined behavior or just bad, so don't do that. You're going to, in this case, access an area of memory that you're not allowed to. So you will now want to only dereference C. And there you go. So if you're in a scenario where you might be accessing a pointer that's dead, you might want to check. So if B, then you can do the output. So in this scenario, this will evaluate to false and it'll not try to access B. However, if I comment this line out, B will evaluate to true because it's not a null pointer and we'll get the value five. Another thing that is useful is getting the use count for a pointer. Now, it doesn't make sense for a unique pointer because it's always one, so you won't be able to do it for a unique pointer, but if you're working with a shared pointer, so make shared and return a shared pointer, and we'll go ahead and make another pointer to that area in memory. You can now output the use count by saying b dot use count. When you run this, you should get the value zero. That was a mistake on my part because we're using move here. We don't actually have to do that because we're using a shared pointer. So we can take b, assign it to c, and now when we say use count on b, we get the value two. So we have a good introduction to unique pointers and shared pointers. Now let's talk about the third one, which is a weak pointer. This one can be a bit more confusing if you don't already understand shared pointers, so make sure you have those down. So far we've had the idea of something being the owner of an area of memory, or you can think of it as the manager. With a shared pointer, you can have one or more owners, and that area of memory is protected as long as there is one owner. Well, a weak pointer is similar in concept to a shared pointer, but it doesn't count as a manager or owner. So it's a reference to that area of memory, but we're not guaranteed that that area of memory is going to be valid still. So if there's ever a scenario where you want to reference some area of memory, but you don't want that pointer to be considered an owner or manager, that is where a weak pointer comes in. It's a lot of words and kind of conceptual, so that's why I'm saying it's really good to understand shared pointers first, but let's go through an example of what this might look like, and that'll make it more concrete in your brain. So let's go ahead and keep this function to return a shared pointer. So this line here, B is going to be a shared pointer. Now instead of using auto here, we can replace this with standard weak pointer. We'll call it C and assign it to B. So when we run this, what we see now is the value one. So it only sees one pointer as a manager. C is ignored. So you have a weak pointer now, but if you remember, the area it points to is not guaranteed to still be valid. That's because the other pointers could go out of scope, the ones that are shared pointers, and your weak pointer is now pointing to an invalid area of memory. This problem was foreseen, so if you went ahead and dereferenced C, you're actually going to get a compiling error. And it says there's no operator asterisk, so it doesn't even have the dereference operator. The trick here is actually to try to grab a shared pointer from this weak pointer and then print the value. So what is that going to look like? Down here we can say auto, and let's give this another name. Uh, I'm getting a little confused with the letters here, so let's go ahead and call this shared and we'll call our weak pointer weak. So that way we can really see how this works. So auto shared is going to be assigned weak dot lock. So this will give us a pointer where we can dereference and try to access the area of memory, but we wanna make sure it's valid before we do that. So you can say if shared and then surround the code to access that data like so. So saving this, we don't have any compiling errors and let's just run through this. We get a shared pointer here. We create a weak pointer to that same area in memory. Now we want to try to access it by first creating a shared pointer from it and then checking the shared pointer. We'll run the code. 
and we can see the output 5. There's a scenario where understanding weak pointers is important, and that's if you have a cyclic reference between two shared pointers. And I'm not going to go through this scenario exactly, but you can see from this code here, you have two classes A and B, A references B and B references A. And these are both shared. In this scenario, A keeps B alive and B keeps A alive. So if you set one of these to a weak pointer instead of a shared pointer, there's only going to be one primary owner. So I wanted to share this because you might run into the scenario, but it's quite complicated and pretty specific, so I didn't feel like I needed to go through this example in full. I'm sure there are multiple other scenarios when you might want to choose one pointer over the other, but the most important thing is to understand how each one works and decide which one would be best for whatever scenario comes up. As a quick review, you can start with basic pointers. If you're doing that within a local function, I think that's fabulous. If you start need to return local data from functions, now you have to use new. That's a scenario where you might want to use a smart pointer instead. Given the opportunity to use a smart pointer, I would prefer to use a shared pointer, unless there's a certain scenario where a unique or weak pointer makes better sense. Thank you for watching this video. I have a lot of other C++ pointers and references and all kinds of different videos on my channel. And we have a very large C and C++ course that's going to cover so many things and give you a lot of depth on a bunch of different topics. So if you want to learn the C and C++ language from beginning to end, I'm not really sure if there's ever an end, but if you want to learn a good chunk of the language, then definitely get on that newsletter to be notified when that comes out. Hoping to have the C section done here really soon so you can access that and that'll give you early access to all of the C++ content as it's released. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what other videos you would like or if you have any tips or suggestions for the future. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.